Hello everyone, welcome to yet another session for the daily news analysis by Sri Ram's IS, where we take up the important articles featuring in the Hindu newspaper and break them down for our understanding from the examination point of view. Let's start today's discussion by taking the first important article for the day. The important articles which we've taken from the Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper are, of, are on our screens and let's take up the first article for our discussion. The first article which appears in the newspaper reads villagers stir against so solar power plants to protect khejri trees or protects khejri trees. Now this is a example of agitation which is coming from the Jodhpur district and Falodi Tehsil and this agitation is made by the Bishnoi community against the felling of khejri trees in the in their in their uh, village and uh, uh, around areas and why are they being cut they are being cut because eight solar power plants are proposed in that area and in order to install these power plants the trees are being cut so the bishnoi community who are known to be environmental loving community and they are uh, continuously have agitated against the uh, felling of trees and deforestation measures so they have yet again they are uh, protesting against the felling of these trees now the protest has been going on for a lot of time and what has happened right now is that the due to the numerous uh, protests the administration of the state has made an agreement between the solar power plant manufacturers and the villagers that no tree would be uh, cut and if any tree is cut a fresh uh, uh, tree would be planted elsewhere. So this has been an agreement which has, which has been reached by the villagers and the sol solar power plants uh, uh, manufacturers but from the examination point of view what becomes important for us is the community and its movement and the khijri trees importance which can be asked in the prelims examination right because from the context of environment these uh, trees become important so we have to understand the role and importance of these khijri trees. These trees are the same trees which when we hear Chipko movement, the Chipko movement also happened for the protection of Hijri trees in the Uttarakhand state and even in the uh, region of Jodhpur, the concept of Chipko movement or hugging the trees or protecting the trees uh, arrived way back in 1730 and it was carried out for the protection of Khejri trees by the same Bishnoi community, a lady known, uh, known as Amrita Devi. She headed this agitation at this point of time for the protection of Khe same Khejri trees from the then Maharaja. So we'll also take a look at this uh, 1730 agitation which was led by the Bishnoi community as well. So first starting with the importance of Khejri trees. This is the picture of Khejri tree. This is how it looks. And why is it special? Because this kind of a tree, as we can see, the region is Jodhpur. It is growing in the Thar Desert region. So, uh, anyways, not much vegetation is able to flourish in the regions of Thar Desert. But such kind of trees flourish and that is why they hold much importance. How do they hold importance? So, let's look at some of the importance of Khejri trees. They are, first of all, due to their uh, growth, that, the, that, that it is one of the few trees that grows in the region, it is considered sacred by the community over there and it is also equivalent to Tulsi as, uh, as in when they start, uh, the, uh, 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 the Bishnoi community, when they start anything, they uh, uh, give water to the Khejri tree, so they consider the tree as sacred and second, the tree plays a vital role in maintaining the ecosystem for the dreary Thar region right because of its ability to survive in such tough conditions. So simply because of the fact that it is, is able to survive in such desert conditions it greatly enhances the ecosystem stability and then it also becomes a source of firewood and fodder for the animals and then the Khejri tree helps in sustaining the nutrient value of the soil as well and ensuring a good yield. So whatever limited agriculture is also carried out in the state these trees contribute to the yield because they maintain the nutrient value of the soil and enhancing the yield. And the fruit which these tree, uh, trees bore is used to make the very popular local dish. If, if you visited Rajasthan, you would know it is known as sangri and can fetch up to rupees 300 per kilo for the farmer. So even the fruit 
from the tree is of uh, importance, economic importance for the farmers. And the khejri bark is used medicinally for a range of ailments and can be ground up and made into flour and famously saved thousands of lives during the great Rajputana famine of 1868. So even the bark is medicinal in use and it can be used for uh, the purposes of flour. And the flowers make an amazing bee fodder. So it, uh, it, it, it makes for bee fodder and we know that bees are very important for the ecosystem because they help in the reproduction of plants and transfer of nutrients. And then even the timber of these trees is useful. So we can see that there are multifaceted use of the presence of these trees in the desert region. And not just this, the trees also stabilize sand dunes and can withstand periodic burial. So the sand dunes which take place in the desert region, these trees stabilize the sand dunes. So as we can see the player, they play a holistically important role in the uh, desert region and that is why any development work that is carried out in the Rajasthan region has to be taken care that these trees and their role is also not subdued and they are also equally protected. So hence an agreement has been carried out right now. It remains to be seen how effective it is and uh, these trees uh, are protected enough or not because as, uh, as the news reports say, the numbers of these trees is steadily declining which is a cause for worry. So this was the discussion with respect to the importance of Khejri trees. Now as we saw that this Vishnui community is not new to protesting against the felling of these Khejri trees. Way back in 1730, this is a picture painted at that point of time. In 1730 when the then Maharaja of Jodhpur wanted to cut these trees to build a new palace, a lady known as Amrita Devi agitated against this leader against the felling of these trees. Right? So the uh, Agitation for environment uh, environment goes way back uh, for the Bishnoi community in 1730. This was done in 1730 and the inspiration for Chipko movement which was headed by the activist Sundarlal Bahuguna also uh, drove his inspiration from this movement, right? So this was a discussion with respect to the Khejri trees and the important points around it. With this let's move on to our next article for the day. The next article which appears in the newspaper reads Congress BJP spar over the new forest rules. Now the important point uh, from this article which we have to extract is the new forest rules which become important for us from the perspective of GS3 where we study environment portion. So what is the context? The context is that the center or the union ministry for forest, the ministry of uh, forest and climate change has notified the Forest Conservation Rules 2022. These are the new rules which have been promulgated by the central government under the Forest Conservation Act and the Forest Rights Act. So these are the new rules which the centre has notified and both parties are disagreeing on certain provisions of the rules. So from the examination point of view, what becomes important for us is to know what these new rules are. So let's look at that. What does the new rules that are the forest conservation rules 2022 say they add certain new uh, uh, provisions with respect to the monitoring uh, mechanism and review mechanism of the forest. So first is on monitoring it says that there would be constituted a monitoring committee, an advisory committee, a regional empowered committee and a screening committee at the state and UT level. So these committees would be set up that is an advisory committee which would be set up to give advice to the government or based on which project to carry out on which in which area should it be carry out a regional empowered committee for that region and a screening committee. This would be there to check the rights and claims of the uh, vill villagers from the forest whatever they have. And second is the rule on integrated regional office which means that there would be an integrated regional office set up which will examine all the linear projects that is the roads, highways and involving land up to 40 hectares and the use of forest land up to 0.7 canopy density. So what does this mean? 0.7 canopy density in India, the forests, we have mentioned this in our sessions before, the forests are defined uh, and classified on the basis of their density as to how dense they are. So their density is uh, measured on the basis of their canopy level. So canopy level goes from 
10 to uh, and then goes on increasing. So the, in this case, the use of forest land which, be, which would be examined by the regional office, the canopy has to be 0 0.7. This is the nature of the forest that they would be dealing with. And the time frame that is given in the rules is that a fixed time frame for quicker review of, of each project. Now, why are all of these uh, provisions being instituted? So, we see that in a lot of forest areas, in commercial projects or infrastructural projects are to take place. And these projects, when they are taking place, they hold the danger of harming the environment. So, so that these uh, issues are being taken care of, the new rules uh, account for setting up of new committees to settle these issues prop uh, quickly and properly. And the rules also give responsibility to the states where the states are given the responsibility of settling forest rights of forest dwellers under the Forest Rights Act of 2006. Now this act becomes a very important act because it was instituted to protect the forest rights of the uh, tribes and uh, people uh, dwelling in these forest areas because uh, traditionally these people depend a lot on the uh, forests for their produce, for their fo uh, fodder, food as well. So, the, uh, so and they, they have traditional claims of ownership over those forests. So, in order to protect those rights, the Forest Rights Act of 2006 was instituted and it was said that any activity that is to be carried on with the forests or carried out in the forest, the rights and the claims of forest uh, dwelling communities would be respected and their consent on altering the state of the forest would be taken. This is the issue of conflict between both the parties where the ruling party who has promulgated the rules, the opposing party is saying that while promulgating these rules, the rights of the tribal communities and forest dwelling communities under the Forest Rights Act is being violated where uh, now from now onwards any project can be carried out without taking the consent of these forest dwelling communities. So this is the issue. So for that we understood what are the new rules that are that are being talked about wherein one of the provision is for allowing compensatory afforestation in other states which means that if the state already has over two thirds area under green cover or over one third area under forest cover then compensatory allowance can be taken in other states where the cover is less than 20 percent which means this is a provision added for those states which are more in for forest area so that they can benefit from this uh, provision. So these are the new rules that are being added under the forest conservation rules 2022 and now we look at the important aspects of the forest rights act as well. Now the forest rights act which was enacted in 20, 2006, as I said, was enacted to for the crucial uh, purpose of protecting the interests of the forest dwelling communities, the rights of forest dwelling tribal communities and the other traditional forest dwellers to forest resources on which these communities were dependent for a variety of needs, including livelihood, habitation and socio-cultural needs. So in order to maintain harmony between development and these forest uh, dwelling communities forest rights as well as forest conservation, this uh, forest rights act was enacted. So what did it do? It recognized and vest the forest rights and occupation in forest land in these forest dwelling scheduled tribes, certain tribes who fulfill a certain criteria of living in the forest for a certain amount of time were being given the status of forest dwelling scheduled tribes and these tribes would have the exclusive rights and privileges to reside in these forests, take use and make use of the forest for collecting the produce, food, fodder and they're uh, using it for livelihood, they would have those rights. So this became an important piece of legislation for these communities and other traditional forest, forest dwellers who have been residing in such forests for generations. So it strengthens the conservation regime of the forest while ensuring livelihood and food security of the F FDST or the forest dwelling uh, scheduled tribes and other traditional fo forest dwellers. They sh uh, it strengthens the, the, the rights for these communities. And the nodal agency which takes care of which rights are to be recognized is the Gram Sabha. It is the authority to initiate the process for determining the nature and extent of individual forest rights or community forest rights. So there are two kinds of forest rights under the Forest uh, Rights Act. One is the individual forest, uh, individual forest rights 
which means that those forest rights which are belonging to an individual and there are certain other forest rights which are belonging to the community as a whole as a whole they are known as the community forest rights and who will decide all these rights the village gram sabha this is a important piece of a uh, provision that has been added in the forest rights which makes the forest governance a, a more uh, in a, in a more democratic way so this is an important piece uh, to be remembered so and how does what are the rights under these act as we saw uh, apart from the individual rights and collective rights the, these individual rights and collective rights are divided into certain other component rights wherein an individual can have title rights which means that the ownership any land in the forest who is it owned by there can be they can be owned by certain communities or certain individuals so they get ownership rights over the land the land that is being farmed by tribals or forest dwellers as on 13 december 2005 this is uh, just before the enaction of the act subject to a maximum of 4 hectares ownership is only for land that is actually being cultivated by the concerned family as on that date meaning that no new lands are granted so people who were cultivating lands before the enactment of the act they to to a limit of maximum 4 hectares will get the ownership of the land only if they are cultivating some uh, crop on that land then they get use rights which means that they have the right to use the forest produce to minor forest produce such as including ownership to grazing areas to pastoralist roots which, which means that they can use these forest for their various uses either collecting the minor forest produce to grazing their uh, cattle and uh, whatever pastoral roots they have through going through uh, for going through those roots so they get these use rights in the forest as well and then they are also provided relief and development rights to rehabilitation in cases of illegal eviction or forced displacement in a lot of cases while the forest activity is going on these tribes are illegally displaced from their forest areas so they would be uh, rehabilitated back to those areas so those rights are under relief and development rights which would be granted to the forest dwelling communities and fourth are the forest management rights the forest which they are living in they they are provided certain autonomy to protect forests and wildlife so this is an important piece of legislation which comes into uh, the fore so with, which which uh, establishes a healthy balance between the forest conservation and the communities living there as well because the communities who live in the forest play a vital role in conserving the forest as well But that is why they are very important that uh, the government recognizes the rights of the forest dwelling tribals uh, uh, communities as well and then what is the process for recognition of these rights as we saw the gram sabha stands at the implementing point to decide these rights so the gram sabha or village assembly initially passes a resolution recommending whose rights to which resources should be recognized and then this resolution is then screened and approved at the level of the subdivision or taluka level and subsequently at the district level for the reviewing of this there is a screening committee instituted consisting of three government officials from the forest revenue and tribal welfare departments and three elected members of the local body at that level at the uh, taluka level or the district level and these committee also hear the appeals so we can see the level of hierarchy the gram sabha passes the resolution and that would be reviewed at the taluka level and the district level by the screening committees which would have a presence of the government officials as well as the elected officials so this becomes the process for establishing the rights of the forest committees communities right so with with this we finish this article let's move on to our next article for the day the next article which appears in the newspaper reads intense rain leads to rising water level in the idoki reservoir now what becomes important for us in the uh, in this article is first of all why is the idoki reservoir getting filled the uh, indian monsoon has reached the indian subcontinent and uh, that is why excessive rains are being seen in the uh, no, uh, southwestern area in the regions of maharashtra kerala karnataka due to this what will happen the perennial rivers which flow all the year round the dams which they will have 
will uh, get, uh, extra water will get collected in them. So all the dams that are, that, that are situated in area are seeing an increase in the water level rise. So this becomes important for us from the examination point of view where we look at the location of the Iduki Reservoir, which state is in, which river is it uh, a part of. Uh, so Iduki Reservoir forms a part of the Periyar River. It is located on the Periyar River. So and Periyar River is a very important river for us from the examination point of view. So we'll trace its origin and it's, uh, we'll look at its important points. So this becomes important for us from the point of view of geography and environment. So about the Iduki Reservoir, we see that this is the Iduki Reservoir on the river of uh, river Periyar in the state of Kerala is a double curvature arch dam constructed across the Periyar river in a narrow gorge between two granite hills locally known as Kuravan and Kurathi in Mariapuram village in the Iduki district in Kerala. So the, what we need to understand is that it is on the river Periyar and it is in the state of Kerala. Now something about the Periyar river. The Periyar river is an important river because it is the longest river in the state of Kerala with a length of 244 kilometers. So it's a very important river in the southern region. And it is also known as the lifeline of Kerala as it is one of the few perennial rivers in the state. Then it where, where does it originate from? It originates from the Shivagiri hills of the western Ghats. As we see, most of the rivers flowing from west to east originate in the western Ghats, the Godavari in Nashik, the Krishna river in Mahabaleshwar, Ka Kaveri in Karnataka and now Periyar in the Shivagiri hills of Western Ghats and flows through the Periyar National Park. So this is the Periyar river where we have the Iduki dam over here and this is the location for the Mulla Periyar dam as well which also is seen in news a lot and where is the Periyar National Park? We can see over here the Periyar Tiger Reserve is also near to the Mulla Periyar Dam. So th that is why this river becomes important because it becomes the uh, vantage point for a lot of uh, important places such as the national parks and dams. And the main tributaries of river Periyar are Muthi, uh, Muthira Puza, Mulayar, Cheruthoni and Perijana Kutti. These are the important tributaries which one can remember with respect to the river Periyar. But what is important is the origin point that of Shivagiri Hills and it flows in the state of Kerala and has these dams, right? So this was a discussion with respect to this particular article. Let's move on to our next article for the day. The next article which appears in the newspaper reads Twitter's petition on section 69A of the IT Act. Now this is an uh, important conflict that has been going on which we need to look at from the examination point of view where, where what becomes important for us is to know the issue and to know what this section 69A of the IT Act or the Information Technology Act is. What does this section say? How is it becoming the bone of contention between the Twitter which is a social media company and the central government? So the issue is that the central government is wanting the Twitter to take down certain posts and take down certain accounts which are active on its uh, site. And Twitter after hearing or after taking the complaints from the central government is unwilling to do so because it feels that these accounts are not much of a problem and by taking these accounts they would be violating the uh, free speech, uh, uh, rights of free speech which are guaranteed to everyone. So this is the conflict which is going on which, uh, which is why Twitter has instituted a suit against central government. So we'll look at what is the section 69A which the government has used against uh, this social media company uh, that is the Twitter. So what is section 69A first of all of the in, uh, Information Technology Act? It is, it allows the center to issue blocking orders to social media intermediaries. Now social media intermediaries is a broad term in which social media sites like Twitter get covered. We we'll look at what do we mean by intermediaries. First, the blocking orders are given by central government. The, the, so the power to issue blocking orders is basically the crux of section 69A. And under what grounds are these blocking orders can be given? 
so they can be issued only for these particular grounds that is in the interest of sovereignty and integrity of india in the defense of india security of the state friendly relations with foreign states to maintain public order and for preventing incitement of the commission of any cognizable offence relating to the above mentioned grounds so as we can see these are an exhaustive list but they are quite broad measures what can come count as interest of sovereignty for the country and integrity of the country is a matter of perception and therefore these grounds can also be liable to be uh, interpreted vaguely so that is why these are the grounds on which the blocking orders can be issued by the central governments to social media intermediaries so what do we mean by intermediaries the intermediaries under the act include telecommunication companies such as idea vodafone airtel all these companies are telecommunication companies the internet service providers those people who provide internet at the offices and homes the network operators web hosting services search engines payment gateways and other relevant portals and services so all those companies who are involved in this uh, transmission of the uh, internet and involved in the business are clubbed under the social media intermediaries and the central government can give their blocking orders to any of these companies who fit the definition of intermediaries and what is the process then of instituting such a blocking order so any request made by the government is sent to a review committee which then issues these directions so first the government sends these uh, uh, blocking request to a review committee which after re reviewing issues these directions to the intermediaries and blocking orders is issued under 69a of the it act are typically confidential in nature so they are confidentially supplied to the social media intermediaries and are there any penal provisions for the social media inter, uh, intermediaries if they choose to not follow these orders so the act says or prescribes punishment for any intermediary for failure to comply with the government direction punishment can be imprisonment for up to 7 years and shall also be liable to fine so for not following the orders of blocking of the government 7 year punishment can be granted to these intermediaries that is why twitter has uh, shown problem with this order and it has gone on to institute a legal case against government so what are those grounds why is twitter filed the lawsuit twitter has claimed that many of the blocking orders are procedurally and substantive substantively deficient under the 69a of the act which means that the grounds of orders that are being given uh, in the blocking orders they do not fulfill the conditions as we saw that those orders do not pertain to the security of the state by blocking those accounts or taking down taking down that information would not amount to harm, harming the security of the state this is what they are meaning when they saying that those orders are procedurally and substantively deficient they are not fulfilling the grounds under the act then not giving prior notice to the users before taking down content posted by them so the orders contain taking down of certain content by posted by certain users and the tw uh, twitter not being given time to give prior notices to these users so that they can be given prior notice and they themselves can take the content down so twitter it's claiming that since they were not able to give prior notices they were not given enough time that is that also becomes a reason for uh, the Ill illegality or the uh, insufficiency of these blocking orders and then meti or ministry of information and uh, electronics and information technology has failed to demonstrate how some of the content it wants taken down falls under the purview of section 69a as we saw the blocking orders and the grounds mentioned under the act are not matching for twitter and some of the content flagged by the ministry may pertain to official accounts of political parties blocking which could be violative of the right to free speech so this is as i mentioned is the ground twitter is saying uh, is that some of the accounts are belonging to official political parties so just because the center may want to take down the rival political parties accounts twitter feels that this would be a breach of their right to free speech and that is why it is moved against center to file a lawsuit so this was the backdrop of the battle between center and twitter and what becomes important for us is the substance of the section 69a as to what it says under which act it is promulgated and what is the substance so 
this was our discussion today with respect to the important articles of the day we'll meet again tomorrow with the tomorrow's important articles thank you